just realized my folks online that uh, I was muted. Uh, sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> so all I was saying is uh, I was trying to do a little recap on what we did last time. I talked about context surrounding Don Quixote in 16th century Spain, or 17th, early 17th century, late 16th century Spain. I started talking about uh, <clears throat> Some of the key themes last time in this work, I uh, established a little bit about Don Quixote's character, uh, and I tried to make a lot of second-level connections so you could start, begin to understand his character, uh, and, and maybe you could start relating to the work as well. Uh, <clears throat> I also talked a lot about Cervantes as the author, narrator of this story, as well as his various invented personalities as the author, and how, like Said Hamet Benengali, who is the Moorish uh, author of part of this work right here, which is Cervantes invented him. It's actually Cervantes himself. Uh, <clears throat> and I talked about how that was novel for its time, and in fact, this work, Don Quixote, uh, might be well said to be the first novel of all time. Uh, <clears throat> so, and that word novel means new. It's a new form. Uh, and, and this form of writing uh, for Cervantes is one of the ways in which it's so new, is that, or novel, is that... <clears throat> It's a wholly written form, whereas literature prior to this was almost always told orally, uh, even though there are written works and things like that. Th there's no way to really t retell this work orally. Uh, it it's meant to be read, uh, and it's a book about reading in many ways. Don Quixote goes mad because he sits around and he reads all these books all the time. Uh, and so... Uh, it's really interesting, too, how this work explores the ways in which fiction can blend with reality. As we get to book two of Don Quixote, it's going to be even more fascinating. Uh, so in, in our book that we have right there, Don Quixote, uh, there is the first book of Don Quixote within there, which was written by uh, Cervantes around the turn of the 17th century, but then later in his life, uh, a decade later, he wrote uh, the sequel to Don Quixote, uh, and it's going to be real interesting because the sequel to Don Quixote, in that book, Don Quixote realizes that somebody by the name of Cervantes has written a book about him, and he starts talking about himself as a fictional character. Wow. You know, who did that around that time? Nobody had ever done that before. Uh, Don Quixote becomes a fictional character, realizes that he's a fictional character, but then the fact that he does that makes you question, wait, but is he in the real world? Is this novel in the real world? Cervantes becomes a character in the story, and thus we become characters in the story. It's some of the different ways in which this story is so fascinating in the way that it's told. So I established a lot of that last time. Um, <clears throat> I also established a lot about Don Quixote's character in chapter one. I started walking you through that chapter, uh, and I talked a lot about the character of Cervantes himself as an unreliable narrator, as an unreliable author, uh, and, and that in many ways is one of the most uh, telling innovations of this work, the, the fact that he's questioning the authority of the author. Um, <clears throat> it's really uh, something that you got to keep in mind as you're reading this work, is never to take it too seriously. What happens if you take a book too seriously? Look what happens to Don Quixote, right? He takes his books too seriously, and every time, every new chapter, we see him getting beat down in some different way. At one point, he later becomes known as the Knight of the Sorry Face. Sancho Panza gives him that title because he's lost so many teeth from getting beat up so many times in these various escapades that he has that Sancho calls him the Knight of the Sorry Face. You can just imagine the emoji 
for Don Quixote. Um, <clears throat> so fun stuff there. And I started telling you a lot of this stuff in order to anticipate some of the answers on the quiz. And I actually, uh, I think I walked you through the matching portion of the quiz. And I started walking you through the identification portion of the quiz as well, especially in relation to Don Quixote and uh, Cervantes. So I think that gets us to where I can start moving forward. I also talked a little bit about the prologue uh, and... Uh, one of the purposes of this work right here is to satirize these works of chivalry, these books of chivalry that are famous in this time. Uh, and I started talking a little bit about chivalry and the code of chivalry, which you need to understand in order to understand what the heck Don Quixote is doing. Um, so I started establishing some of that. Okay, I got us through chapter one. Uh, and I talked about <clears throat> uh, the character of the narrator and the character of Don Quixote as well. <clears throat> and I started calling into question the different ways in which this work is portraying him as a madman, but at the same time, the ways in which the work portrays him as having a great deal of sense, perhaps uh, more sense than anybody else. One of the things that you need to know about this work and its conception is what Cervantes says himself in the prologue I had you to read. Uh, <clears throat> Cervantes says, I conceived of this work in prison. Uh, Cervantes was in prison many times. Uh, he was a slave for five years of his life. He was captured by pirates and uh, lived as a slave in Algiers to Moorish people, which might explain why he doesn't like the Moors very much. Uh, <clears throat> but he, he lived his life as a slave. And so when you think about this work as being a thing conceived in prison, and when you think about Cervantes as being about the same age as Don Quixote when he was written this, and when you think about the fact that people back in the day very rarely lived after 60 and Don Quixote's in his 50s, uh, then you kind of see how this work might be, how Don Quixote is kind of like Cervantes himself. Uh, you kind of see that Don Quixote, faced with the fact that he's close to his own death, faced with the fact of his deplorable circumstances in which he lives, no dignity at all in, in his circumstances. When you start thinking about that, you realize that's the power of fiction. That's the power of living a life uh, that, uh, <clears throat> inventing a life for yourself uh, that's more fun than the life you're living in now. That's the power of the imagination. And that's some of the thematic topics that are going on in this work here, is the power of imagination, the power of fiction. Uh, and in some ways, though, that fiction gets him in great degree of trouble as well. So <clears throat> it's really hard to find one set meaning in this work, and Cervantes does that on purpose. Anytime you seem like you arrive upon a thematic truth, like I just came upon, you know, whenever I said that this work talks about the power of the imagination and how it can help you to escape deplorable circumstances. That's a thematic statement there. Uh, <clears throat> at the same time, whenever you talk about the positives of it, you got to look at the negatives too. And that's why I pointed to Don Quixote and how he suffers because of the great degree that he uh, believes his own fiction. Hmm. Okay, uh, I defined what a knight errant was as well. And we started talking about Dulcinea del Toboso, de Toboso who is his lady love uh, that he has basically never met. There's different presentations of Dulcinea in this work, at least three different ones that I know of, uh, where she's a completely different person. And this one right here on page 29, you'll see that maybe he met her, maybe he, maybe he didn't, but she's always a good-looking peasant girl that he imagines as a princess. 
uh, and not always a good-looking peasant girl. In book two, uh, Sancho uh, tells Don Quixote that he's found Dulcinea. And since Don Quixote in that book has never seen Dulcinea, uh, he's like, well, this is her, and she's the most hideous person you could ever imagine in your life. And Don Quixote thinks that she's been enchanted, that some sorcerer has put a spell on her and made her an evil-looking, garlic-smelling uh, <clears throat> peasant girl. <clears throat> so it's fascinating. But <clears throat> Don Quixote, who... Keep in mind, his reality is so dismal. But this life that he creates for himself is so exciting. I mean, every young boy wants to go out and have an adventure, you know, and wants to be a knight in shining armor. Uh, and Don Quixote is not a young boy, but uh, in some ways the work is arguing uh, about what old age is like as well. How can we... Uh, have dignity in our old age or find adventure in our old age. Okay, so Don Quixote leaves home. Like we, we see the gray alert. Is that what it's called? Silver alert? Is that what it's called when, a, when an elderly person escapes the nursing home or something like that? The silver alert? Uh, that's what happens with Don Quixote here. He escapes his home and his uh, niece... And his housekeeper and all his friends are worried. Oh, no, what has he done again? He's gone off. Uh, <clears throat> and he's taken this armor and everything. Um, <clears throat> so he mounts Rosinante. And this is his purpose right here, to redress grievances, to right wrongs, to correct injustices, to rectify abuses and fulfill obligations. These are all pretty good purposes right here. These are, when you look at it on the surface of things, it's hard to argue that to right wrongs is a bad thing. Uh, Don Quixote goes out and he's got a good purpose in mind. Uh, he, he also has some selfish purposes. Uh, you look in the previous you know, thing right there, he wants to be an emperor. He, he imagines great fame for himself. Uh, so he decides to go out uh, without telling anybody his plans. <laughs> and he goes out in the heat of July, and he gets so hot that his brain turns to mush. Uh, <clears throat> and he encounters Don Quixote, creates this fiction for himself, but there's some problems with his fiction. Uh, he realizes that there's some holes in his story. And later on, as we read Don Quixote, uh, Cervantes himself notices there are holes in my story. I left things out. Whoops, uh, the plot hole. But he just makes it part of his fiction. Uh, and that's uh, one of the ways in which Cervantes is so ingenious here. Later on, Sancho has his donkey stolen, but then magically, a couple of chapters later, as if Cervantes forgot, Sancho has his donkey again. He's riding on it. You know? And so there's instances like this throughout the narrative where <clears throat> it, plot holes. And so Don Quixote has a plot hole here. Oh, 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 I'm not a knight. Nobody's made me a knight. So he says... I'm going to have myself knighted by the first person I chance upon, in imitation of many others who've done the same. Uh, <clears throat> so he's going to rise upon somebody and make, make them make him a knight. The problem is, is that there are no more knights anymore. That There are no more knights in this time period than there are now, walking around. Uh, <clears throat> So <clears throat> look at the contrast between Don Quixote writing his own fictional story that makes him famous versus how Cervantes portrays uh, Don Quixote because there are moments like this when Don Quixote writes his own story, but because it's enclosed within Cervantes' Don Quixote, we can't help but read it ironically. Uh, 
So I just read the passage where Don Quixote goes out on his sally right here, and his brain is turning to mush from the hot sun, and he looks terrible. Don Quixote writes his own introduction to his story right here at the bottom of 30. Who can doubt but that in future times when the true history of my famous deeds sees the light, the sage who chronicles them, Cervantes, will, when he recounts my first sally, will write in this manner. Scarce said ruddy Apollo spread over the face of the wide and spacious earth the golden tresses of its beauteous hair, and scarce said the speckled little birds with their harmonious tongue. It's really beautiful and flowery language, right? But that's not what Cervantes wrote, you know? So uh, we, we see a contrast between Don Quixote as an author of his tale versus Cervantes as an author of his tale. <clears throat> So we, we, we see a little bit of discussion about the Golden Age versus the Bronze Age. And this is going to be pretty important. It's important to think about how Don Quixote sees the world. He believes that the world was once in a Golden Age. We talked about this in the Metamorphoses, right? Uh, the world was once a Golden Age where everything was perfect. But now the world in which he lives is in a Bronze Age. Everything has fallen apart. There's sin everywhere. There's people robbing and killing and raping and all this stuff. And his purpose in life is to bring the world back to that Golden Age. That's why he's gone out as a knight. And so he keeps bringing that up. Hmm. You see the contrast of the narratives again right here. Uh, he's talking about, Oh, Princess Dulcinea, mistress of this hapless heart, great injury have you done to me in reproaching and dismissing me. Uh, <clears throat> and then we see how Cervantes says, He strung these absurdities together with many others, all in the style of those he'd learned from his books. This made his progress so slow, and the sun was rising so fast that his brains would have melted if he'd had any. So... <clears throat> Uh, at times, Cervantes is very cruel to him. Hmm. But as the narrative goes along, he's, it, it seems like he seems to be less constantly cruel to him uh, as we get hundreds of pages behind us. Okay, uh, so we see his illusion come face to face with reality. He arrives at an inn, and he believes that this inn is a castle. And he thinks that uh, that these pigs and things that he hear bleeding outside of the inn are actually uh, people uh, bugling and announcing his arrival as, look at this beautiful knight here coming here. And then he sees these uh, ladies who he thinks are maidens in waiting at the castle, but they're really lewd prostitutes in the end, uh, and he sees the innkeeper who is a foul uh, dude uh, who at the same time uh, swindles people, has swindled, swindled people in the past, and he thinks that he is a good king. Uh, <clears throat> and he talks to people in this high flowery language that he learned from his books. He says to these prostitutes, who he thinks are ladies, moderation befits the fair. Furthermore, laughter which springs from a petty cause is a great folly. Uh, he says that to her, and they say, this language which the ladies didn't understand, together with the sorry figure cut by the knight, only redoubled their laughter. Uh, <clears throat> and his wrath. So Don Quixote, when you look at his character, he is, one of his faults is that he's very quick to anger. Uh, he's very wrathful and angry, especially when people make fun of him, right? Uh, and they're making fun of him because, what are you, an idiot? You know, who talks like that? Uh, Don Quixote thinks that people talk that way all the time. He's convinced himself because that language is more beautiful than regular language. 
Uh, and that makes him very angry. Anytime somebody challenges his reality, it always makes him very angry. Uh, so when you think about it that way, it might make him a little bit more relatable there. Uh, anybody comes up, have you ever had people come up and tell you you're wrong? You know, it's like you, you just have no clue. Uh, and I mean, that makes sense. I, I can see how that would be infuriating, especially if people tell you that all the time. Uh, <clears throat> but he, at time and time again, he runs into people like this innkeeper who, uh, who are willing to play into his illusion. Uh, different people do it for different reasons. Some people do it in order to help him later on uh, the barber and the, his niece and cats like that try to play into his illusion in order to try to help him. But other people will play into his illusion in order to make fun of him and deceive him. Uh, and, and that's exactly what this guy does right here. So there's great fun made of Don Quixote uh, as he tries to eat with this cardboard visor that he has attached to his helmet that's wrapped around with um, straps and stuff like that. And Don Quixote is very happy even though he's eating black and moldy bread that he thinks is the best food ever and the worst cooked salt cod and stuff like that. Uh, <clears throat> He's having a great time. I suppose it's better than actually thinking about how awful it tastes, and <laughs> you know. Uh, so on one level, it's like, whoa, how how much of a fool can you be? And on the other level, it's like, well, it's better than the alternative. Um, <clears throat> so Don Quixote is nothing if not persistent. That's another character trait of him. Uh, hmm. he, he has insisted that this innkeeper knight him, uh, and he gets down on his knees and refuses to get up until uh, the innkeeper promises to grant his request. Uh, hmm. So the innkeeper comes up with a big joke to play on D Don Quixote. Now, People will do this time and time again, and sometimes these jokes backfire on them, and sometimes they don't. In this case here, uh, the joke backfires on the innkeeper pretty well. Um, <clears throat> what Quixote does is he, in order to gain his knighthood, he has to... Uh, he has to guard his armor all night long. And that's, a, that's apparently a thing in a lot of these books of chivalry here. They have to guard their armor uh, to show watchfulness and duty and diligence and all that stuff. And Don Quixote, he lives right up to the task. He watches the armor. He won't let anybody mess with it. And we also see his great courage. Uh, what happens is these muleteers, these people who got all these mules and everything, they're going up and trying to get a drink of water, and Don Quixote's kept his armor where that water is. you know. So they remove the armor in order to get the drink of water, and Don Quixote defends his armor. He bashes them within an inch of their life. you know. In some cases, now... Uh, in this case here, this is what happens when people refuse to recognize other people's fictions. In the case of Don Quixote's fiction, when somebody refuses to recognize the reality of his fiction to him, he bashes their head in sometimes. Uh, but on the other case, uh, it happens back to Don Quixote as well. Whenever uh, he runs into somebody you know, who's stronger than him or he's ready, you know, and won't accept his uh, reality, sometimes he gets knocked into rubble by reality. So 
Uh, it's a really interesting play that goes on there. There's a violence between fiction and reality going on. If there is one thing that Don Quixote is on the bottom of 39 there, it is courageous. For all of his faults, you can't help but say that he shows great courage time and time again, or foolishness, right? Uh, in this case here, uh, he beat one of those men up, and now all of them are coming and ganging up on him to beat him up. And what does he do? Uh, he says, hmm. he refuses to move, right? Uh, he calling the perfidious traitors. He says, come over here, stone me. Come, draw, draw near me as best you can, and you'll see who I am. So faced with all of these different people, he stands up to them. So the question is, does Don Quixote, does Don Quixote know that he is living a fictional life or not? And this will come up several times in the narrative, is how serious is he about this fictional life? Is he completely insane, or does he have a sense that, no, I'm inventing this reality here? In moments like this, it seems like he believes full-heartedly uh, that uh, he is a knight and that he's facing all of these evil people uh, that, that have come to uh, keep him from being a knight, and he stands up to them. He's willing to die for it. Um, <clears throat> and so the innkeeper seeing all of this, he decides to end it all by giving him what he wanted, and he knights Don Quixote here. Uh, <clears throat> and Don Quixote believed every word in this case there. He was ready to obey the man, all of the uh, orders he gave him. Okay, uh, chapter 4. As we get to chapter 4, when Don Quixote leaves the inn, you see how he's characterized. He's so happy, so gallant, so delighted at being a properly dubbed knight. The very girths of his horse were bursting with joy. Uh, so he decides to go home to get some money. And what happens? He runs upon somebody moaning. Now, here we have an instance of Don Quixote trying to right wrongs. And we see this several times in the narrative. And I'm going to read you, have you to read another scene where he tries to right a wrong. Uh, and... He does a very poor job of it. But in one sense, it's like, well, at least you tried, you know? Nobody else was going to try. In this case here, he comes upon this young boy who's been strapped up to a tree, and he's being beat by his master. Uh, we see a lad about 15 naked from the waist up, and he's being flogged by a burly farmer. Uh, and we learn why the man is doing that. Uh, there are two different stories about why he's getting beaten. In one case, the man who's beating him says, uh, I'm doing it because this kid is not taking good care of my sheep. And the boy says, no, he's doing it because he doesn't want to pay me his wages that he owes me. Uh, and we do learn that he hasn't paid those wages as well. Uh, <clears throat> so it's kind of hard to blame the lad for not doing a very good job that he's not being paid for, in one sense. Uh, <clears throat> Don Quixote makes the argument, This courteous knight, it ill becomes you to assault one who cannot defend yourself. Mount your steed and take up your lance. Uh, I shall force you to recognize your actions are those of a coward. So if there's one thing that Don Quixote hates, it's cowardice. And he sees this farmer, he imagines the farmer is a knight. And he imagines that this farmer has the same code of moral virtue that he has. And this is his mistake, 
ultimately. He assumes that everybody else have this same moral code that he has, but in reality, in the real world, people don't have a moral compass. We, time and time again, we come upon people in this real world that don't have a moral compass. But Don Quixote has a moral compass, and that's one reason why he's relatable, but it's another reason why he messes up a bunch of times. So he tries to defend this lad who's getting beat up here. Now, in the time period, most people would have just let him do what he wanted because that's his worker, that's his servant. He can basically do whatever he wants to to him. But Don Quixote doesn't live by those rules of society. He has a different idea of what's just. Uh, <clears throat> and so Don Quixote shows himself as the defender of the weak. Uh, <clears throat> and the farmer uh, swore by the tight corner he was in and by the oath he'd already sworn. He hadn't sworn any oath at all. And it wasn't as much as all that. And so he says, I'm not going to keep beating this guy. I'm going to let him go. Uh, just don't kill me with your lance there. Hmm. And so the boy's like, well, okay, you know, are you going to let him go? You know, and, he, and Don Quixote says, my command will be sufficient to ensure his obedience. Don Quixote tells him to behave himself and to do what he should do. Uh, and he gave me an oath by the laws of the order of chivalry, and so he shall allow you to go three. Three. And the lad talks sense. He says, my master here isn't a knight at all. He's never been admitted into any order of chivalry. He's just a rich farmer. That is of little consequence. There's no reason why someone with a plebeian name should not be a knight, for every man is a child of his own deeds. Uh, <clears throat> so Don Quixote lets him go, having faith that the farmer is going to, you know, abide by the laws of chivalry, by a moral code, but of course he doesn't. And what happens as soon as Don Quixote leaves, uh, the farmer straps him up again and beats him within an inch of his life. Right here. Flogged him half dead. So Don Quixote tries to do something good, but his problem is that he thinks that everybody else follows a moral code and that the real world has no moral code. So what are we, we're trying to get a thematic statement out of that. I mean, <clears throat> some people walk around living their lives uh, as if everybody, you know, is going to do the right thing, that they have faith that people are going to do the right thing and stuff like that. And so they, they make actions accordingly. But in reality, people, a lot of people are out there not to do the right thing. They're out there to hoodwink people and to steal and abuse and trick and all of these things. And later on, Don Quixote is going to free some criminals who are, you know, being held captive uh, and stuff like that. Don Quixote believes their story, believes that they're going to do good and all that stuff. And as soon as he turns around, they beat him senseless. Uh, so we're going to see this. Okay. So some people seem to think that the real world is just as fair as heaven. But uh, uh, this story seems to imply that the real world is not so fair as heaven. You know, th th there is not karma in this case right here. But uh, Don Quixote will make the argument time and time again that there is karma, that God will redress grievances and things such as that. If not in this life, then the next life. Um, and that connects to the Decameron, something that we read there uh, already. <clears throat> Don Quixote, one thing that he does is he's, he, he keeps ri riding upon people uh, and keeps demanding that they admit 
that Dulcinea is the most beautiful uh, person on earth. And, and when he runs into these merchants right here at the end of this chapter, chapter 4, he demands that they you know, acknowledge that. And they say, uh, well, let us see her, you know, and then we'll do it. But Don Quixote's faith is a blind faith. He says, no, if I let you see her, what merit would there be in confessing that truth there? So he says, you have to believe without seeing. And, and this, in instance, is very similar to uh, faith in, in, in God uh, that we were reading about in the Hebrew Bible and stuff like that. Uh, <clears throat> there's a merit, there's a value in uh, faith without seeing. Uh, and that really defines Don Quixote and who he is. He believes that he is a knight without seeing it. He believes that this is a castle without seeing it in reality. Uh, so it says, says a lot about the way he views the world. All right, let's move on to chapter, let's move on to Sancho Panza. Let's get some final thoughts on Sancho uh, as we move forward to our readings for, for um, Wednesday. Don Quixote gets beat up by these merchants. Uh, and we see how cruel reality is. Uh, <clears throat> who wouldn't want to escape cruel reality? Um, <clears throat> And instead of just sitting there and imagining how much pain he's in and, and acknowledging the fact that he's been beat almost to death, he uses fiction to cope with this reality. He imagines a scene that's going on, and this peasant man finds him and, and tries to help him uh, to get back home, uh, and Don Quixote imagines that he's a fictional character in one of his stories, and he's having a good old time. So it has a thematic statement. What are the values of fiction for real life? In one of these cases, again, we see how it allows us to escape harsh reality. Uh, <clears throat> all right. Don Quixote goes home, and it takes weeks for him to start feeling good. Okay? It takes weeks for him to start feeling better. Uh, in the meantime, while he's kind of passed out, uh, we see uh, the priest and the barber. These are uh, Don Quixote's friends, and we also see uh, his niece and his housekeeper. They, they plot together to try to cure Don Quixote of what he's going through. And I don't think I can get to Sancho Panza today because i got to talk about this chapter here. Uh, <clears throat> In chapter 6, their plan to cure Don Quixote of his madness is to burn all of his books. So they think, well, the books are the source of his madness, so if I burn the books, then that's going to cure him. Now, they're the authors of the mischief. And in one sense, you know, Cervantes has already said that he hates those books of chivalry and the prologue there. But I told you last time that he had to have read them all in order to, you know, end up scrutinizing them. So he probably enjoyed them, <laughs> you know, but uh, on the surface of one thing. Uh, and, you know, in one sense, of course, Don Quixote is crazy, right? But uh, the housekeeper has an illusion as well. The housekeeper is just as suspicious and, and mystical as Don Quixote as well, but they don't call her crazy. Uh, whenever he says that he's going to go in there and burn the books, she says, here, Reverend Father, take this holy water and sprinkle it on these hordes of enchanters from the books here. So she thinks that the books actually have enchanters in there. So we see that Don Quixote is not the only one that thinks that these books have a power. She uh, has a belief in a false mysticism as well. So the priest laughs at her simple-mindedness. Now, 
look at, if you want to know how the narrator feels about this, when they're about to burn the books right here, it says, so anxious were they to see those innocents massacred. So the narrator, it seems like he's arguing, at least in this part right here, that the books are innocent, which is a contrast to what they're saying there. It's Don Quixote who is the author of his own madness, not the books. Uh, <clears throat> now, th there comes to be a really kind of hilarious uh, discussion here about now that they're decided to burn the books, that they start asking, well, do they all deserve to be burned? And so they go through them one by one, and they're trying to figure out why some books should be burned and why others shouldn't be. Of course, Cervantes, as, as Cervantes as a lover of books, you know, and me as a lover of books, uh, and you know, considering well, that I hate the idea of book burning at all, you know, I, I see this enterprise as a, you know, I don't like it very much. Um, <clears throat> So they decide to burn some books and they decide not to burn others. Among the books that they decide to not burn is a book by Cervantes himself, Galatea. So here's another instance where uh, we get uh, some right here, Galatea by Miguel de Cervantes. is a book uh, that they're not going to burn here. <clears throat> and... It's self-reflexive in this sense right here. Cervantes is often critical of himself. Uh, he says right here, the priest says, that fellow Cervantes has been a good friend of mine for years, and now he's more conversant with adversity than with verse. His book's ingenious enough. It sets out to achieve something, but doesn't bring it to a conclusion. You know, uh, maybe we'll pardon it. I don't know if he can get his act together. <laughs> so... Cervantes, in one sense here, Cervantes puts himself into this fiction. But by doing that, Cervantes is a character in the real world, right? We accept that. But aren't we in the same world with him? Or if we were born 500 years ago, you know, uh, in that sense. Uh, so in this sense, the reader becomes a part of the fiction itself. And that, that's a really neat uh, aspect of this right here. It calls us to question what is really fiction and what is really real. If we say that we're real, we recognize that this is a work of fiction, then how is there you know, a real person in the work of fiction? So it, the thematic statement is uh, <clears throat> how hard is it to separate reality from, you know, from fiction? You know, where does the line begin? Okay, now in the chapters that follow, in the second sally, which means Don Quixote is going to go out again, they burn the books, but it doesn't stop him. They, they tell him that some dragon has come and taken them off, you know, uh, it, but it doesn't stop him. He goes out again, you know, uh, and this time he takes Sancho Panza with him. And now Sancho Panza is going to be the great fool uh, for uh, Don Quixote. He is, Sancho Panza is equally deluded as Don Quixote. Uh, because Don Quixote, here is where Sancho becomes introduced in chapter 7, page 61. Uh, we see that Don Quixote tells him that if you come out with me and go on this adventure with me, I'm going to make you the governor of an island, you're going to be a, a great ruler, you know, and, and Sancho Panza is this poor peasant who, in some versions of the tale, spends his days shoveling poo, that's the only way he can get money, uh, <clears throat> and, and so he's a little short of salt in the brain, right here, is how he's described right here, so he's not very smart, uh, and Don Quixote deludes him into thinking that he's going to be the governor of an island. It's like, so he's just as crazy as, you know, Don Quixote for believing the crazy man and following the crazy man. But the irony is that in book two, 
Sancho Panza does become the governor of an island, if only for a little bit, right? And we're going to read a little bit of that. Look, at, it's going to be fun to see how well Sancho Panza does at actually governing an island. He does better than anybody else before him. Um, <clears throat> but Sancho, and this is what I'm going to leave us with, he's a peasant. And heretofore, works of this nature have always criticized the lower classes, classes and people like that as being sources of evil, corruption, and not worthy, and stuff like that. But Sancho Panza is uh, novel because he's an honorable man right there, if a poor man can be called honorable. And he's got his tongue in his cheek there because Panza does have a great degree of honor. We could see that in dignity in this work, even though <laughs> at times he has no dignity at all. But there are moments... Uh, <clears throat> okay, and Pons is going to be uh, Don Quixote's companion as we read forward. Now, let me give you a look forward to Wednesday. Now, Wednesday, you're going to have an informal reading journal, just basically proving to me that you've been reading thus far. Uh, at this point, you should be uh, through about 